Welcome back to What's New with Mead. We're in episode number 30, and I have a very fun guest today, the creator of a very well-known recipe and a mead scientist in his own right. Uh, I have Bray Denard on the call with me, and uh, I'm super excited to have him. Bray, I'm super glad you're here. Thanks for, Thank thanks for waking up early. <laughs> I know that yeah, you could be- for having me. You could be sleeping in and doing whatever this morning, but here you are talking about mead. Hey, no problem. I'm always happy to talk about me. So, so um, I want to first ask you about your uh, brewing slash mead experience. Like, what do you, when did you start? What, what can you tell us about that? Uh, I've been brewing, well, I started with beer. Um, basically, during the time when I was working on my PhD in microbiology, my brother-in-law gave me a beer kit and told me that if I didn't know how to brew beer, then I was useless. Uh, so it's hard to argue with that kind of logic. Uh-huh. Uh, so I decided to, to go ahead and start brewing beer. Well, being adventuresome as I am, it was only a matter of time before I found this thing called mead. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I mixed up some water and some honey and some yeast. No nutrients, no pH buffering, none of that stuff got extremely lucky and it turned out beautifully. The first batch. The 10 or 15 after that were pretty terrible. So that's when we had to get science involved to create some reproducibility. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Uh, So so that's basically how this whole thing got started. I often wonder what would have happened if that first batch hadn't turned out. (laughs) It's true. And that, I think we'll dive into that too, about um, the, the dangers of, of that right there, not knowing what you're doing sometimes and not doing little bitty uh, steps that can like change the end result of your mead. I'm sure we'll dive into those, but um, I find that interesting. I started, I mean, I have not been brewing. I think this is my first thing I brewed was six years ago, something like that. So um, I, and it was a beer, you know, I, I got into the mead world three and a half, almost four years ago now. So this is, uh, it's still very new. I know you've been in it much longer than me. Um, and I'm thankful for that because I, I can definitely rely on you and we can rely on you for valuable information. Um, so many people know your name because of a specific recipe and every place you've been and talk about this, I'm sure you've gotten pretty tired of it, but you are the creator of the Braze One Month Mead. Now, uh, I want to kind of dive into this first, and it'll undoubtedly tailspin into some other things. But that mead recipe is is uh, created to be done in one month. Now, my first question for you is, how many iterations did it take before you feel like it arrived at that the first one month true braise bomb mead? You know what I mean? Uh, so... Basically what happened was, you know, trying to create a reproducible mead that was ready quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, 10 years ago, we didn't know as much as we do now. Now Mm -hmm. information is pretty readily available. Back then, I mean, nobody had really done the experiments. So it started with an experiment. Here's what I want. I want a mead that's done fast. I want it to be good. I want it to taste like mead, not like beer. Yeah. So I... My hypothesis in the beginning was two things. The first thing is good nutrition. So basically, let's get some nutrients in there that are are good nutrients. And at the time, the only thing we had was Firm K and DAP. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, there were there are other wine nutrients, but that's what was readily available to me. Uh, I decided, you know, using my microbiology background, uh, pH buffering is very important. Uh, so I decided to add potassium carbonate, uh, later found out potassium actually will help the yeast push to a higher alcohol content as well. Oh, interesting. Uh, so it actually has twofold purpose. Mm -hmm. So I basically established a good nutrient protocol first, and then I said, okay, well, maybe it's a, a yeast thing, you know, maybe I need to find a yeast that will actually do what I want it to do. So I hypothesized that uh, perhaps ale yeast would do a better job faster because in beer turnover generally tends to be a lot faster than wine turnover. So I did ale yeast from basically all over the world. And out of the first batch of experiments, the best one was a Belgian yeast. So 
Then for the second experiment, I decided to test a bunch of different strains of Belgian ale yeast. Mm -hmm. And that's when I discovered 1388, why yeast 1388. And uh, the first batch with 1388, it was drinkable in two weeks, but it really got good in a month. Um, And since then, I've kind of used that as my workhorse. But as time has gone on, the science has caught up with us. And we're now understanding that more than anything, nutrition was the real problem. Mm. And so that was when Fermade O came about. Mm -hmm. And Fermade O uh, was initially made really popular by Tosna, which uh, is Sergio Montella's um, kind of his nutrient protocol that he developed and used. And, uh, And that works really great for dry yeast. So yeast that you have to rehydrate. Mm-hmm. For liquid yeast, it was kind of hit and miss for me. Uh, so I had to kind of centering around Fermate O, make a protocol that would work consistently with liquid yeast. And that was the big improvement to the bomb that came later. Uh, I was trying to figure out how to get rid of DAP because we later learned that DAP doesn't uh, uptake into the yeast after about 9% ABV. Mm-hmm. And it can leave some really harsh off flavors, especially on the back palate of your mead. Mm-hmm. So I was trying to figure out how to get rid of that anyway. Well, it turns out Fermato also offers superior aromatics and a uh, much more consistent ferment. So, um, so that's kind of how it, you know, started at the experiment stage and then went on to where it is now. And now I've basically used it as a Swiss army knife. I've done everything, weirdo mills, pie mitts, braggots, you know, metheglins, whatever, whatever you want, you can make it with this. But now because of the improved nutrient protocols, you're not limited to one yeast. You can use any yeast you want and still get a decent mead pretty fast. Yeah. Okay. So my first, I got a couple questions coming off that, but first one is um, in your experimentation, were they one gallon batches? Were they, did you go half gallon? Cause that's a lot of yeast to put to the test. Uh, for initial experimentation, I typically do one gallon batches and, uh, and, and this is kind of my standard thing. I'll do one gallon test batches mm-hmm. and because I'm extremely picky, especially these days, you know, it, it may take three or four iterations to get it to where I think it's really good and then I will scale it up. Okay. Yeah. And I, I really wondered, I've, I've seen people do as small as half gallon batches. And then there are people like my friend doing the most, um, his gold standard, he does one gallons, but his standard is five gallons, which to me, I'm like, holy cow, that's it's crazy. But I just wondered where you fell in that world, especially testing yeast. Um, I do a lot of experimentation things, kind of like what you're talking about. And um, if I were to push past one gallon, my room would be I mean, it's already full. It would be just insane. So um, I, I definitely know that, that that's kind of like the best experimentation volume, in my opinion. Yeah, for experimenting, it's fine. But then once you, you know, join a brew group with 300 people and you have lots of friends that now enjoy your mead, one gallon yeah. just doesn't last as long as it you used to. You got to up it for sure. That's for sure. Um <laughs> So on that line, since you have been in this game so long, uh, what's your biggest fermenter you have? Are you pushing past 10 at this point? Uh, So I have, um, I have 10, 20 gallon fermenters. Uh, I have some barrels, uh, which I love barrels these days. And uh, barrels just are magic. They just are. What size barrels did you find? Uh, I have used... Um, basically five liter, 20 liter, and then, you know, you can go as big as you want with a barrel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it kind of, it boils down to, you need to always keep it full. Mm-hmm. So you have to be willing to commit. <laughs> yeah. That's what scares me about them is you can't, you can't let them, like I said, they have to be full. And so it's a lot of planning. Um, I looked into getting one, even just a small one, and I'm sure I could fill it all the time with it, but um, with the amount of projects I have behind me, remembering that I got to circulate this thing. I was like, I don't know yet. So one day I'll get there, but um, not quite yet. Um, well, just so you know, once you go there, you can never go back. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You're committed. You're, you're sold. Um, okay. So you, you said something really interesting in there. And I wondered, I wanted to ask about this. Your, 
the uh, why was it 1788? I'm sorry, I'm, I can't remember now. Why use 1388? 1388. Excuse me. Um, there's been like this uh, uh, rule on rule you can't break online for the bomb, in that you don't divert from that yeast. And yes, uh, and I think it's I think it's very true. And it, you mentioned just a moment ago that they the science we're finding now is that maybe nutrition was the bigger play in it. Obviously yeast in part their flavor in part their, their fermentation process in their special way. Um, if someone did not have access to 1388, is this a situation where you would say, eh, don't do it. Or do you have comparable second place, third place yeast you would suggest for people? Uh, these days, I don't really look at it that way. Uh, these days, I look at yeast as like tools in a toolbox. Mm -hmm. Don't use a hammer where you need a screwdriver. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, I will take the yeast recipe that I'm working with, and I may start with 1388 just because it's kind of my standard go-to. Mm -hmm. It's extremely neutral. It doesn't really impart very much of anything, which makes it really good for experimentation purposes. But then, like, let's say you're making a rotomel something with rose hips in it. And you can make it with 1388. It'll be very good. But then you go, you know, I just really like to enhance that rose flavor a little bit. So move on to some W15, which is a dry yeast. Mm -hmm. Use Tosnum protocol and go that route. So basically what I do is my standard for experimentation is 1388. And then I'll taste the recipe and decide, okay, well, maybe this yeast would impart something that would make this mead even better than it already is. And so, uh, you know, as far as saying something is first or second place or whatever, that's really tough because it depends on your recipe. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's the thing is that playing around and experimenting with enough yeast that you kind of understand what they bring to the table. And then that helps you know, okay, well, I'm tasting this in this particular mead and I think this yeast would really enhance that just a little bit more. And the thing is, is that it's, it's small incremental steps making it better. But if you've got five incremental steps, all of a sudden you have something that's amazing. And so this, this comes down to a lot of experience, you know, of testing these different things, knowing what they impart. And then also just your specific recipe and what you're going for. You know, what you think is amazing and what I think is amazing may differ. Mm -hmm. So yeah. ultimately we're all making it for ourselves, but we hope other people like it too. <laughs> That's true. It's true. And I encourage people with that as well. Um, I think that this has to be a personal project. Everyone's palates are different. You might make the most amazing mead that you've ever tried and love it. Mm -hmm. And you give it to your friend and they don't like that specific mango taste you got. And you can't, I, I don't know. I think it's, uh, it's tough to lean on your friends as the sole um, voice of, critique because lots of at least my friends when i give them stuff it's like there's a there's probably 30 percent where they're like super interested in the flavor of whatever mead i've made or that i've given them and 70 percent is like free booze thanks dude you know what i mean so <laughs> yeah. and they're not going to come back and start ripping into you um most of the time with free booze now some friends are able to do that and willing to do that and those are the ones that i rely on to give me true critique of things. And if you join a local homebrew club, you know, a lot of times there'll be at least one or two judges in there mm -hmm. that, you know, if you ask them and say, Hey, I want you to put on your judge hat for this. They'll be brutally honest with you. Good or bad. Yeah. You know, and that's helpful because you need to know where it's good and where it's not good because how are you supposed to improve if you don't understand there's a flaw there? Yeah. It's, um, and just like what you do, everything you're doing has a stair-stepping effect to, um, to a, a goal, to what you want it to be. And that means you're experimenting, like I said, with yeast all the time. Undoubtedly, you've experimented with different fruits and spices and combinations of things. And so if anyone's listening, that's, that's what you have to do. Follow recipes, but then take and change an element of the recipe and see what happens. And that's the only way to get better at it. Absolutely. And, and, you know, adjusting things to your personal taste and, and understand that things have terroir, uh, your spices, your honey, everything has terroir. So that means that 
you know, slight differences in weather or temperature from one year to the next, it changes a little bit. And so you may have to change your recipe a little bit mm-hmm. to, to get that same level of mead making. Yeah. And, um, and then, you know, playing with your balance and things. So, and that's a huge thing, you know, a lot of people starting out, uh, the recipes are good to put them on a good path to basically get them to a product that is actually really good and drinkable and get them started. But then after that, you know, the world is your oyster basically and mead making is mm-hmm. so versatile. You can do whatever you want. You know, I started out trying all the different styles and then I started out again, trying all the different yeast. And then I did a whole bunch of Oak experiments and now I'm into rare Amazonian herbs and spices. Mm-hmm. It's like, you just go down one rabbit hole after the other. <laughs> yeah. And you never really get to the end because then it kind of circles back once you, you know, you can start to take the wheel and go to different points and combine your Amazonian spices and your, you know, exactly. suddenly your barrel aging. So it's, that's what I love about mead making. When I jumped in, I knew it was, the pool was deep, but I had no idea how deep it was until I um, honestly started making it and, re- and questioning what I was doing wrong. Yeah, And uh, to, this is not all on our list of things to talk about exactly, but I do want to ask you, you've been in the game a while and you said it's changed over years. What are some like mead myths that you heard when you first started that you've either debunked or, you know, questioned over time? For example, you know, like the raisin idea or a raisin nutrient. At this point, we all know. Kind yeah, of. raisins are definitely not nutrients yeah. unless you want to use like two pounds a gallon. Exactly. Which you might as well just make wine. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's been scientifically proven. So that's not even arguable at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just doesn't have the yan requirements necessary. Right. Uh, but it is great if you want to add a little bit of tannins to your meat. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's part of your balance, you know. Uh, so the thing is, is that debunked, man. 71B had a bad rap for a long time. They said if you let it sit on the leaves too long, it would develop bad flavors. Hmm. No, what happened was we had poor nutrition and they were getting angry at us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, many people will tell you now that that's not really the case. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I'm not saying you should let it sit on the leaves forever, but still, you know, it's not as bad as initially claimed. Mm-hmm. Uh, some things like uh, D47. Uh, don't let that go over temperature. That's just true. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. you, you need to have that one at a good, consistent, mm-hmm. below 70 temperature. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, it gets angry at you. Uh, even with good nutrition, it can be mm-hmm. it's less, but still. Have you uh, tried, uh, sorry, side note, have you tried Gronfell meadery before? I actually have quite a few meads in the fridge right now. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know that he uses a lot of D47 and um, he does push it to its upper echelon, which I thought was interesting because um, I'd heard that too. You know, we, we see the yeast packet information, whatever, stay between 60 and 75. And uh, most people, if you go outside of those boundaries, you start to hit the wall. But D47 is one I'd heard you could kind of go crazy with. All the Kvike strains are, <laughs> you can... Oh yeah. Take I've used a lot of those. the sun. Um, yeah. It's, it's just interesting. I wondered if you tried his stuff. Oh yeah. Uh, most of his stuff I've really enjoyed. Um, I, these days I tend to have more of a sweet tooth. So I like his higher ABB stuff, mm-hmm. but that's kind of my style. You know, you've got people that, that like the lower ABB carbonated stuff. You've got people that like more like a wine strength. And then you got people like me where I like the big, you know, punch you in the face flavors, mm-hmm. you know, high ABV, but balanced so that you can't tell it's high ABV. You know, that's kind of my thing that I right. like. To and that's just entirely up to your taste. Whatever you enjoy, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Mm-hmm. So, um, and, and that's, you know, kind of how I always look at it is, you know, this is, this is not a hobby for the elite. This is making what you like and enjoy that. Yeah, I think people, um, and I don't want to lump myself in in your world, but I do want to say that people who do experimentation, uh, I think that's where that the pool does get deeper. Most people are just swimming in the in the shallow end, which is great. You know, take yeah, your smart. recipes and 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 have fun with it in that regard. You don't have to go crazy deep. 
um, you can let the people like us who want to just, you know, test 400 million yeasts at 800,000 <laughs> temperatures do it. Yeah, I, I get a lot of, um, I don't know, it's very fun to just do that. And I, there's a weird side of me that's like, why do I enjoy this experimentation so much? But I don't know, there's something exciting about it. And, you know, it's always amazing because I like to bring uh, experiments to brew group and club meetings and things like that. You know, I'll bring, you know, three or four meads, all exactly the same, made with different yeast. And people are just absolutely shocked mm -hmm. at how much difference the yeast alone will make. And, you know, it's just one thing after another, you know, different types of oak, different concentrations of oak, different times of oak, di different temperatures on that same oak, you know, million variables and it, it all so, it's so important to like to know the know the changes i think that's where that experimentation of just going a little deeper it helps the the main thing that i've learned over the years if you if you're you know trying to help somebody is try to put it in a way that's very easy to understand mm -hmm. and so uh the way that i treat my meats now it's very much about balance and the elements of meat that you're really considering is your sour component, your sweet component, your tannin component, which that can be raisins, it can be oak, it can be black teas, it can be some rare spice that you've discovered and decided to try to use. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing is just the, the overall impression of those things put together. The, the, I guess you could also call it a savory component because it's like the aroma and how those things work together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've had recipes where I'll have the recipe worked out really great, works fantastic with this honey that I have, and then I'll change the honey and nothing works anymore. Yeah. So you got to make sure your honey matches everything else and so forth. And, uh, you know, like I said, my, my thing is I really like high ABV meats, but I don't like the taste of alcohol. Almost no one does. Right. <laughs> So you need to balance that with your sweet and your tannic components. And so that just takes trial and error and learning what you like and, and how you want to balance that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, that's one of the things where if you can explain it in those simple terms, you know, sweet against sour, you know, sweet tannins, sour working against each other. Mm -hmm. And basically if you've got that circle there, you can start to figure out what you need to do to improve your meat. You know, got to start with a great nutrient protocol for sure and temperature control if you can do it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can't do it, then those, those Kavik yeast, uh, those are do it for you. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're really amazing. And, uh, but even them, you know, if you ferment that yeast in the wintertime versus the summertime, it's going to taste different. Mm -hmm. You know, it may not taste bad, just different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you have to consider those things. It's, um, well, I have a question on that. Let me fix my light real fast. And then I got a, a new question for you. I sure thing. It just a moment ago. Just want to cut it in here real fast and say, if you're enjoying the podcast and want to support the channel, feel free to check out manmademead.com. It's the one-stop shop to find recipes, brewing information, all of the YouTube series, and Amazon affiliate links that support the channel. You can simply click on the links, and when you purchase through that link, it actually, a, a part of the profit goes back to the channel and helps me continue to create content for you all. So I hope you will join me there, and thanks for listening. Back to the show. All right, so... My next question, I want to ask you about, we kind of briefly talked about it, the development of the uh, bomb, braised one month mead recipe over the years. Uh, how have you changed it from maybe that first one you posted to the 2021 version? Or has there been an, any change? Uh, the major change, I would say, is the nutrient protocol. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, if you look on my, on my site, dennardbrewing.com, uh, you'll see that I actually have, I reference the original uh, nutrient protocol, and then I reference the new protocol. And the new protocol, uh, I worked out in response to Fermate O becoming available, and uh, a combination of that becoming available and the fact that I wanted to get away from DAP. Uh, 
the DAP, you know, if you're unlucky and your ferment goes too fast and you didn't check and you add it, then you're going to have off flavors. Mm -hmm. And it's just better just to avoid that altogether if you can. Mm -hmm. uh, but in addition, like I said, the Fermato does offer superior aromatics for the meat. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I developed uh, a protocol where basically – uh, I was using from 80, but Tosno wasn't working. And the reason was really pretty evident to me. When you work with a dry yeast, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to re-ferment, uh, not re-ferment. You're going to uh, rehydrate that yeast with GoFirm. And GoFirm is basically a nutrient shot for the mead, for the, mm -hmm. for the EC. And so, since they have that, that benefit of the go firm, then the sequential uh, additions of firm 8 O are, are just fine for dry yeast. However, with liquid yeast, which I'm working with ale yeast, I have my own ye yeast bank. So mm. like basically everything mm. I work cool. with is liquid. Yeah. Um, so at this point, um, I'm realizing that since I don't have go firm, I need something to make up for that. So that's why I add um, basically what's the commercial legal limit for Firm K. Now, Firm K is trace nutrients, vitamins, mm -hmm. minerals, that sort of thing. Very similar to the idea of GoFirm. Mm -hmm. um, so I still kept the Firm K, but what I did was I dropped the levels to be within legal limits in case I ever wanted to go for commercial. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the Firm O is added based on your starting gravity. So basically, the lower your gravity is, the less nutrients the yeast require. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically, you know, I have a table that's, that's on my site and everything where basically you can see how much you should add per your gravity. And in my recipes, I already have that built in. So you don't have to, you know, most people that just, they just want a recipe, that works great. You can just mm -hmm. do that. Um, and so over the years, you know, I've, I've tried to make the, the recipes as simple as possible and then expand. So, you know, on my site, I have all different kinds of recipes, all different levels of difficulty. And so people can really get out there and experience things without having to do too much work on their end as far as figuring out how things go together. Yeah. And uh, of course they can always tweak it and make it to their liking or whatever, but at least I'm giving them some sort of easy starting point which is what I was always shot for. Interesting. So I, um, obviously the base recipe of the bomb is uh, keeping true to orange blossom honey and everything else that goes in w within that. I just wondered, uh, I, especially since you developed your palate even more since then, if there was any part of you that was like, oh, well, maybe I should have tweaked with this. But it sounds like you, you uh, put it to the fire enough to be able to get the recipe down well enough you know to that post you you didn't just post your first attempt you posted your 85th or whatever attempt at it which is uh i think that makes it a true uh valuable recipe and obviously it's stood up in the mead world because people know it well and that's it's a standard yeah I, I mean i had no idea that it would blow up like this i was just trying to to science it because i mean you have to figure that when i started most people would tell you that you couldn't drink the mead for six months to a year. And you know, now three and a half years ago too, there was one of those. Now, that... now I, I'm making mead that I can drink in 10 days mm -hmm. and it's 16% ABV drink it in 10 days. That's, nice. <laughs> That's crazy. So, I mean, you know, this is, this is one of those things where you can't do that with every recipe, but I have quite a few where you can. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to make it more like beer making more, you know, a quick turnaround, but still have a good product. So, um, you are, you generally stay away from DAP. Um, do you think that it's something that everyone, even like people just jumping into the, the world, I know DAP is super available and this is the only argument I have for it is that some people, can't get anything else. They can't get the Fermatos or K's or Go Firms. Is it um, life That's or death for those why. people? That's actually why I left the original protocol yeah. in the recipe for people to use. Mm -hmm. Because you are correct. I, I, you wouldn't believe the number of emails I get. I cannot get this. Mm -hmm. Can I use this instead? 
And the question is, is always answered by, I don't know, try it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, just try it and let's find out. Uh, that's all I can really tell you. If I, mm -hmm. if I haven't used it, I can't, I can't really say that it's not usable, but I, I can't really say it'll turn out the same either. So what are the, um, I vaguely know the dangers quote of using DAP. Can you go further into that? You said 9%, it doesn't really hit until 9%. What are the things? Uh, so the thing, so DAP is diammonium uh, phosphate, mm -hmm. and it's basically a, a YAN source, yeast assimilable nitrogen. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically your yeast need this nitrogen so that they can develop peptide chains and, you know, make DNA and that sort of thing. Uh, the DAP is really useful for yeast uh, when they're in their growth phase. So basically when you, when you first uh, hydrate yeast, you wouldn't want to expose them to DAP. Once they're, excuse me, once they're hydrated and ready to go, then you can add DAP. And for the first couple of days, I would say that's okay. If you have no other availability, you could use it the first couple of days and be okay. Uh, but what you want to be aware of is that after about 9% ABV, the the protein channels that are actually able to uptake it are down regulated in the yeast. And so they can't take it up. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that now that DAP is just floating around in your meat and you'll be able to tell when someone has added DAP too late because you'll drink the mead and the first part, the, the, the first part of the flavor will be pretty good. But after you swallow, you feel like this burning in the back of your throat. And that's generally the nutrient bomb is what people call it. Is that basically like you just added too much nutrients too late. I see. And usually okay. DAP is the big culprit. Uh, for instance, if you add Fermate O too late, as long as you clear the mead, you won't really notice anything. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I prefer to use Fermate O because it, it's uh, a little more forgiving if, uh, if you add it late. And also, you know, better product and all that. But if that's all you got is DAP, I would say just make sure you get it in early mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that those yeast really use it all up mm -hmm. because you don't want that hanging out in your mead. Yeah. And I, and I really emphasize that because, like you said, you get emails all the time of people asking, what can I use instead? And I, I honestly didn't realize how uh, fortunate we are here in the U.S. at least and maybe in Europe and places. Um to get access to those things, to Fermados and Fermade Ks and, and even DAP sometimes. Some people don't have access to that. So uh, I, I worry about uh, completely thumbing down DAP for people just because I don't want, I don't want people to not try because they can't use right. something. And so uh, not to say that you have done that, that's not what I mean, but whenever I'm promoting things, I of course want to pro promote Fermate O and K. I did a yeast nutrient tier list um, this past week and I just went through and talked about, you know, Fermate O, Fermate K, DAP, yeast holes, um, what were the other two? Tea, raisins, um, and then fruit skins. And I kind of just ranked them and said, this is, this is the best in my opinion. This is the worst. And DAP fell up there and I think it was the kind of middle of the, the realm. So it's, it's not the most amazing thing, but it's also not, not the worst thing for you to use. Well, as long as you understand the danger ahead of time, you know, you can hopefully avoid any issue with it. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're doing an extremely high ABV mead, sometimes a little dap on the front side can really help it push through. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's kind of a, a very uh, case specific type deal. Yeah. Uh, so you just have to decide, you know, what you're trying to make. And, but if you go down that deep in the rabbit hole, you know, you're willing to do those experiments and yeah. figure out what does and does not work. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I definitely, I started, actually I started with Fermatos and GoFirms and all, all of the, I'll call them nicer nutrients um, because I had access to them and all the recipes I found online had them as their standard, which I believe sure. was, was great. And, um, as I've made more mead, I, I still use Fermatos and K's, but every once in a while I do get a little, little lazy and front load with some DAP. Um, just because 
uh, yeah, I get lazy. I mean, got no other excuse. So <laughs> sometimes it's all all you have, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if and, you run out, uh, I think that the real, like I said, the real danger comes in using DAP if you are maybe uh, doing a staggered nutrient schedule and it's just flying. You know, you can let's assume you you follow the zero two four six one. Um, that day six, if the meat is really just put the gas down, there's a good chance it's past that 9% or past the point where anything good will come of it. So uh, I guess that's where you want to do a hydrometer reading just to touch base and see where it's at before Absolutely. you do it. Bubbles don't matter. Do the <laughs> <No>. gravity. <laughs> yeah. It's, it is interesting. I get a lot of questions of like, is my mead done fermenting? It's still, it's still bubbling. And which is a very fair question because that's how um, a lot of people gauge what's going on in their brew is if it is bubbling. Um, now, could that be degassing? Could that be actual fermentation? You know, you don't really know until you do a hydrometer reading. I've had, I've had meads that were still off gassing six months later, mm -hmm. but were done in 10 days as far as gravity is concerned. That's crazy. Uh, CO2 will dissolve into the solution. Mm -hmm. And the colder it is, the more the CO2 will dissolve into solution. Mm. And so if you're one of the people like I am, where uh, once the ferment's done, I immediately turn my fer fermenter down to cold crash. Mm -hmm. And so it'll just crash it out. Now, if you continue to swirl it every day for several days after that, you'll get most of that gas out of there. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, you just leave it to sit. And then it warms up a little bit. You're going to see bubbles come out of solution. And have it's you, just basic chemistry. Have you done a test? Um, this is one I want to do in the future, an A-B test of some sort to see what the difference between degassing does and not degassing, forced degassing, so to speak, uh, for a mead. Have you ever done anything um, like that? I haven't done an A-B test. Uh, but, you know, I've, I've made a bunch of meads where I've kept them stirred constantly. Mm -hmm. And I've made meads where I just, you know, got busy or whatever and left them alone. And uh, as far as flavors concerned, I can't say that anything was huge, mm -hmm. but clarity, uh, releasing all that CO2 out of solution really does help speed up clearing. Mm, okay. So that's been very obvious for a long time now. Um, as far as flavor contributions, um, I guess if you, if you were to, now, to be clear, there's degassing where you actually put it under vacuum. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, what I think is probably more appropriate to what people do, which is agitation, where basically you're mixing the meat up to get the yeast back into solution. Uh, getting the yeast back into solution on a regular basis early in ferment will help speed it up. Uh, I don't. I haven't really seen a lot of flavor difference other than to say that uh, you're almost doing kind of a Sir Lee treatment, which uh, that's where you're actually trying to get the yeast to mix up constantly because you're trying to increase the mouthfeel of the mead mm -hmm. or wine or whatever it is that you're doing the Sir Lee aging with. Uh, but that's generally more involved and you would need to do that for several months in order for it to have a, a truly significant impact. Um, so, you know, these days I'm pretty lazy. I, I will agitate them. I wouldn't call it degassing because mm -hmm. that would be, that would be applying vacuum to really get rid of all the CO2. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that was a big thing that for a long time we thought that agitation and degassing through agitation was helpful. But as it turns out, not really so much. It doesn't yeah. really matter much. Um, and, and that's another one of those debunked type things that you were asking about. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's funny, you know, uh, over the years, so many things have changed that I, cu I couldn't even like think of things off the top of my head initially. But then as you talk about them, I'm like, oh, yeah, that doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I just live, I feel like I live in the world um, making YouTube videos. I'm constantly looking for the next thing to test, you know. Yeah. Um, one that I'm really excited for, I'm waiting on um, my panel of judges to finish their the judging, but I've done a test to see if you can taste potassium sorbate or potassium metabisulfite. Um, and so I've, I've done it in a way where there's like a, a nothing 
bottle I gave out, there's a potassium sorbate bottle, a potassium metabisulfite bottle, and a both. And the people I gave it to don't know anything about it. They don't know, they only know a number. And so they're taste testing and giving me notes and trying to guess which is which. So um, do you, you have, have any- You have to control by time though. Do what? You have to control by time. So initially you might be able to taste, but then if you age it for a month or two, you won't be able to taste it. Okay. So unless you just dose really high. Yeah. Now, if, if you dose really high on purpose, maybe you might taste something. See, I, I hadn't heard that. Um, but these are definitely over a month old. This test has been, it's been a while since I, I kicked those bottles out to those people. But um, I, I probably overdosed. I did it in little half gallon batches and I tried to do the appropriate amount, but it's a really tiny amount of metabisulfite. You know, yeah. it's just a, uh, it's, it's some pretty potent stuff. So those are tests like that are a lot of fun to me. Um, and I just wondered about that degassing. Uh, it seems like, it seems like a fun test. So we'll see. Yeah, you can give it a try. I mean, like I said, I've never done an AB. Um, but my guess, if I had to guess, the degassing would probably increase the mouthfeel and probably make it clear faster. Yeah. And you don't need to, to correct me if I'm wrong, um, you do not need to do degassing, prioritize degassing as much if you're going to uh, attempt to bottle carbonate. You don't need to emphasize it as much you still want to degas de some but basically what i'm trying to do so i i really feel like degassing is the wrong term what i'm really trying to do is i'm trying to agitate the yeast into solution mm -hmm. it's basically a surface area problem mm -hmm. if the yeasts are compacted on the bottom and only the top has access to the mead that's not going to be as efficient and as effective as all of those yeast being mixed into solution. Yeah. That's really the way I'm looking at it. It's less about the actual gas and more about the contact of the yeast in the solution. So are you, um, do you carbonate many of your meads? Oh yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Are you yeah. forced carbing or are you bottle carbing at this point? I'm sure you uh, I do both okay. depending on the mead mm -hmm. and depending on uh, how many kegs are full. <laughs> yeah. Of course. If, if you've got a choice, definitely go with the force carving. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, at some point you're going to run out of kegs and you got to make decisions. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a, uh, sounds weird, a favored priming sugar? Are you just keeping it classic with the powdered? Or are you liking the carbonation tablets or anything like that? Uh, so I'm probably a little more risky than most folks. What I'll do is I'll wait till the mead is around uh, 1.004 or 1.003 and okay. bottle it. Oh, so that's great. I'm glad you said that because I've always wondered, um, I guess, at what point, you know what I mean, to, to do that. I've if never you calculate, the If you calculate what the addition to gravity is of like those little sugar droplets mm -hmm. that you can buy from like Northern Brew or whatever, uh, generally it gives you about 0 .005 okay. uh, gravity points. And so you and stopping at 0 0.003 or 4 is... Three or four because mead can actually go a little bit lower than one. Right, right. Okay. So it's just, you know, use a good reinforced. I, I like to use champagne bottles mm -hmm. because champagne bottles, you can, you can cap them just like beer bottles as long as you get the right size. Mm -hmm. And, um, and those have worked great. You know, I've been doing this for a long time. I've never had any problems with bursted bottles or anything. And, and mm -hmm. admittedly I'm terrible about stabilizing. Like I I've done it for so long that I've just never really had to. Yeah. And, and that's a function of the way I make my mead mm -hmm. um, more so than anything. Like if you're making low ABV stuff, yes, please. Would you stabilize that? Don't kill yourself. on yeah. glass <laughs> Yeah. But I'm not against it. I'm just saying that a lot of times I don't have to. Mm-hmm. I wonder, so. That's interesting. I, I'm really glad you mentioned that because that's one of those quote tests I wanted to figure out um, the, the stopping point or bottling point because it would be nice to not have to worry about priming sugar. Um, I do all bottle carving at this point because I don't have any kegging operation. I wish I did, but my little eight by eight room that I have in here that's Florida ceiling mead is uh, very full. So I don't, I don't have quite the room to do it, but um I have used, uh, very risky, I've used honey um, recently for some of my priming sugar. And obviously, if you do that wrong, that's 
that can go haywire. It, it, can be, it can be hard to get the, the weight measurement right mm -hmm. with that. That's the only downside with that. Uh, you know, sugar is so easy to measure. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, sometimes I may miss my gravity. Mm -hmm. If I miss that range, then, you know, I may be forced to do something different, you know, mm -hmm. wait for a keg to open up or, you know, I'm, I'm typically against using sugar as a primer in me just because um, I don't have an AB test for this, but to me, it just tends to give it like a cider flavor that hmm. uh, for some meats might be okay. Yeah. But for other meats would be a flaw. Yeah. So it, it just depends. Um, well, I think and, that sugar, sugar source definitely changes the character flavor. And it's not that much sugar, sugar, so you wouldn't think it would matter that much. But, you know. I, it's I'm still in there. It's, it's, it's still a part of the mead. Yeah. You know, not everything you add is part of it, so it can make a difference. So. Yeah. But, I mean, I definitely prefer to put it in a keg for sure. I do try to plan that way because the other thing with bottle carving is you have to wait you know, uh, two or three it, weeks it, at least, you know, you, you got to wait. And if your temperatures are cooler, you got to wait even longer. Mm -hmm. And I don't like the inconsistency. Um, mm. you know, this bottle's really great. And this bottle is flat and this bottle, you know, you just don't know. You just got to get it. Yeah. Getting it mixed in super well. is tough, especially like regular priming sugar. It's that powdery, like almost, um, what's the sugar type? the funnel cake sugar is that powdered sugar yeah powdered yeah. sugar that's that's super you know it'll it'll soak in it'll mix in well but regular sugar honey those can be a little bit harder to fully mix in to the brew and it's also a function of you know did you bottle from the top of the jug or from mm. the bottom how much yeast is in there mm. so Force carving does eliminate a lot of those problems but you know i understand not everybody has the luxury so it would be nice it would be nice <laughs> Hello, podcast listeners and watchers. If you are enjoying this podcast, check out my Patreon. It is patreon.com slash manmade mead. For two bucks a month or more, if you want to support the channel more, you can gain exclusive access and early access to all of my videos. You can also support the channel, help me create new content, and rest easy know knowing that I am able to do more with this mead community. I hope that you enjoy this podcast, and I hope you will come and support me on patreon if you'd like even more me content um, now i want to switch to our last topic um let's talk about building balance in what we're going to call a standard mead now um what is a standard mead to you uh standard mead would be you know in the 12 to 16 percent range and um uh, all honey uh, basically just a traditional mead. Mm -hmm. And really, I would say, you know, even if you don't particularly care for traditionals that much, learn how to make a good one first, because all of your mead making will be 10 times better if you can make a good traditional. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably one of the hardest things to do. Uh, I'm not saying that it's hard to do. I'm just saying that, you know, most people kind of struggle with it. Especially if, you don't, <laughs> especially if you don't really have like any good frame of reference or somebody to, to say, here's a mead that is good. Taste this, you know, um, there's, there's a lot of variance. I mean, when I started making mead, the only mead I had for like five years was everything I made. And, you know, later on when I actually got to taste other people's meads, then I got to say, Oh, well, how did they do that? And how did they do this? And I want to learn how to do that. And, uh, and, and that's how you really can grow, but good traditional, you have to start with good ingredients. You better have a good honey. And that's going to depend a lot on your palate. You know, um, I started with orange blossom, uh, but I hardly ever make orange blossom mead anymore because I have so many other interesting honeys that I really enjoy now. Uh, so you want to find a good honey that's pleasing to your palate and you got to start learning how to taste through the sweetness to the underlying flavor of that honey. Mm -hmm. And after a while you learn how to do that. So you can taste the honey and go, Oh, okay, well this honey kind of has a cherry note or this honey kind of has a peachy note to it, or this one's really like menthol. And so you kind of pick your honey based on what you want to make. 
then once you've decided to make it, you've got to pick an ABV. So this is, this is actually has a lot to do with the balance that a lot of people miss. The way that you balance a 10% mead is completely different from how you would balance a 5% or 15%. So pick your ABV, make the mead in that fashion, and then when you get to the end, then you need to taste it. Now, when you taste it, depending on your honey, you may say, okay, it's a bit thin, and I'd really like to add some body to this. So you've got all sorts of things available to you. You can use uh, F.T. Blanc, you can use oak, you can use uh, a whole bunch of different types of oak mixed together. You can use tea, you can use raisins, like you can use raspberries. Raspberry skins have a ton of astringency in them Interesting. Hmm. and they will actually add tannins. The trade-off is you can't leave them in too long or they'll add too much. Yeah, I was going to say that <laughs> they're pretty potent from what I've, my experience with raspberries. So you, you have to have them in a bag and have them ready to, to come out when you say it's ready. Uh, generally, just a little bit more than you want, pull it out, and then the rest will fall out of solution. Um, but So that's your, that's your tannin component. Now, that tannin component also has to be balanced with your sweetness. So you, you picked an ABV. You also need to pick your sweetness. So those things are set in stone in the beginning. So you say, I want 15% ABV and I want it to be a sweet mead. So I want it to finish at 1.020. So I want it to be pretty sweet. All right. So then you're going to go, okay, now I want tannins in it to balance that high ABV and to help give it mouthfeel. But it still is kind of a little bit flabby. So you decide that you want some tartness to balance the sweetness too. Tartness can be added in so many ways. There's acid blends. You can literally add citrus juice. Mm -hmm. You can add peels from citrus, dried or fresh. Although I would avoid pith if you can, because that adds a bitterness and that's a whole different component. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you have to kind of decide what you like. I tend to lean towards fresh just because that's my leaning, but I've seen a lot of people that have had good luck with acid blends and things. Um, so once again, up to your personal taste. Uh, I have seen people do crazy things like myself, uh, use kombucha Interesting. to add a sour component. Hmm. Uh, there's no limit. But basically, if you're looking at it at its basic components, your ABV, your sweetness level, your tannins, and your sour. If you can get those four things to line up, you're going to have a great meat. Mm-hmm. And that just comes through trial and error with your particular honey and your yeast, which has its own ester profile. And sometimes you're going to make things that don't work. Mm -hmm. It's just fact. Uh, a lot of times you can fix it if you know kind of what to do. Sometimes you can't. Yes. <laughs> so uh, if you use the wrong yeast with the wrong recipe, sometimes all you can do is just make another batch yeah, there's no <laughs> and you are totally right you starting with ingredients nice ingredients is everything but also knowing that whatever you put in you can't pull out you know you can't not easily at least there are some things i feel like will age out but if you put four cinnamon sticks in a gallon and it goes to the primary you're not coming out of the primary and pulling out cinnamon flavor you you've got yourself stuck so <laughs> Um, yeah. Are you talking about the tannic? Uh, I think that's super interesting. And I, I've had that experience recently. I made, um, I have a series on my channel called Can It Be a Mead? I spin two wheels and then the um, one wheel has fruits and stuff on it. One has like just other various flavors. So I spun the wheels and got orange and nutmeg, which I thought was interesting. And uh, ended up getting to the end of the process. The mead constantly needed more sweetness because the acidity from that orange was just like punching me in the face. So I finally got it to a point where acidity from the orange flavor and, and whatever, and the honey kind of were going well together. And I added, I think it was about a half of a teaspoon of just powdered wine tannin to it. And this thing was very sweet. It's like 1.030, but it was palpable at that point. When I added that wine tannin in, it brought the sweetness down 
perceived in my brain at least the sweetness down and it like mellowed it out so the balance between those three elements alone um not even including the sour side like you're talking about uh is it's just super powerful they, each character yeah. or e one element of that little triforce changed the whole thing so playing around with it like you said to figure out um, what cards to play at what time will help you balance your mead. It's trial and error. That's what sucks about this. A lot of people just want to, they want you to hand them a recipe card and say, this is exactly how to do it. But it might not work the same for you. You know, recipe cards can only work in a situation where you have very detailed, you know, basically you've got to nail it down and say, look, you want to use this particular honey from this particular place that you need to buy it from and you need to use this, you know, brand of ingredients. And, and that if you can be that detailed recipes can be pretty reproducible, a mm -hmm. little bit of variation still just because terror, it's nothing you can do about that, but still be pretty close. Um, but there are other times where, you know, if you're working with something that's rare or hard to get, or, you know, maybe you can get it this year and you won't see it again for four years. All bets are off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's not to say that you shouldn't depend on recipes, but understand that um, it's a start. It's a starting point. Yeah. And uh, I, I want to encourage, you know, you said yourself, you have a website uh, full of recipes and yeah. it sounds like recipes with variations too uh, for yeah. people as they have different needs. And I think that's wonderful. My, my website has recipes, but they don't have variations. So I, I had a guy, um, I make a apple pie boche that I, I love. It, it just turns out to taste literally like liquid apple pie, which is dangerous, but super good. And I had a guy email me from Australia and I use uh, graham crackers in it. He emailed me and said, hey, I can't get graham crackers here. I can get them via some system but it was like 40 dollars for a box of wow. graham crackers and he was like i can't really justify that for this this mead is there something to substitute for graham crackers which i i don't know of one um the the end up in answer for that was you could use like baking spices and stuff but the bready flavor from graham crackers was not going to be achieved in many other ways but all that to say, your your substitutions of things can also change the end result. Sure. So I mean, any substitution, especially early on in the bomb protocol, people would, you know, I can't get 1388, so I'll just use this yeast. Mm -hmm. And then it didn't turn out. And that's because it was developed specifically for that yeast at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is pre fermato so you had to follow it pretty rigorously or it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you know, that's one of the things where it's like every, every change you make, you know, you basically void the warranty. <laughs> so right. You have to kind of make your choices and live with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and in some cases like this gentleman, he couldn't get stuff. And, and I get emails like that a lot. I mean, I've gotten emails from uh, people that, you know, were in Ethiopia making Tej, you know, can't get this. Can I use this? I'm like, I don't know. Try it. Yeah. You know. You know, people tell me I can't get 1388 because it's liquid yeast and I live in a tropical environment. It'll die before it gets here. Can I use this? I don't know. Try it. <laughs> yeah. You know, if that's what you got, you got to work with it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I never have any problem with that. And I, I try to help people along the way, you know, if they are struggling with something like that. Um, so um, yeah, you just never know. I mean, I had one guy that he said he was doing an expedition to Antarctica and wanted to make me down there. And so like, I kind of told him as much as I could, you know, I'm like, you're still going to have to keep it warm. I don't know how yeah, hard that, that's, be. <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know the lowest fermenting temperature yeast. I feel like it's somewhere in the low, like fifties, mid fifties, but. Yeah. So I don't know how warm they keep their, their living environments down there, but, but, you know, it's, it's just, you know, you, we wouldn't believe the number of things that come in. It's just amazing stuff and stuff I never would have been exposed to mm -hmm. if I hadn't have just put this out there, you know? Yeah. And well, uh, so I have, I have one last question for you. I want to ask you, do you have any, um, 
dream mead that you haven't made yet or something in your world that you're super excited to make soon? Soon, yes. Uh, this one's going to take some explanation. So uh, I told you that I've been experimenting a lot with Amazonian herbs and spices. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this one mead I make called Sinjakara. It's based off of an old Amazonian recipe that I could only find in Spanish. I had to translate it roughly and play around with the recipe, but I finally got it right. It's on the tap behind me. Oh, nice. Um, it's, it's wonderful stuff. I love it. It's, there's nothing to compare it to. You, like, you've never had anything that tastes like this. Mm -hmm. So much so that a lot of people will taste it, and they have to drink half a glass to decide if they like it or not. It, yeah. It's really that unusual. But there's one thing in it, and this is like you were saying, where, you know, yeah, you discover all these spices, but then you end up going, okay, well, I can take this spice and add it to this other stuff that's more normal to give it a little extra. So I want to make a mead with Hungarian oak, French oak, American oak, gesho, which is used to make uh, tej, mm -hmm. and the wood that's used in Sinjakara, which is called palo guaco. Interesting. And this is going to be the, the quintuple wood. Um, so this one, this one's going to happen pretty soon. Uh, but it's going to take, it's going to take some playing around. It's not, I don't envision this being right. First try. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's not, that sounds awesome though, man. That's a lot of, that's a lot of wood. Um, obviously so, one imparts its own flavor. That'll be really interesting. I'm curious. And it's going to be tricky to get that balance right. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I can, I can envision in my head it working out very well if done properly. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. I, that, I feel like you have a lot of those in your brew house. Um, a lot of really cool projects like that. Do you, I honestly can't say I've checked out and spent a lot of time on your website. Um, can you tell us where to find your recipes slash you and maybe your brew adventures? Uh, so dennardbrewing.com is where I keep all of my recipes, experiments, articles, everything up to date. Great. Um, and, uh, you know, I have different sections of brews. So I've got beer, I've got mead, I've got, you know, barrel aged brews. I've got what I consider to be insane brews, mm -hmm. like, you know, making a banana mead with nothing but honey and banana puree, no water. Mm. And then back sweetening it with bourbon barrel aged maple syrup. Okay. And uh, that one, that one is so painful to make, so painful to make, but Everyone loves it, so I keep making it. Man, the, that's that's like a, a YouTube clickbait title, No Water Banana Mead. That would just be, everybody's like, what the heck? It is delicious. It's that's absolutely It sounds delicious. great. Man. It's like, the thing is that bananas add so much body to it and so much flavor that the thing turns out like 19% alcohol and you can't taste it. Mm. It's dangerous. I actually use it as a liqueur in banana tropical drinks. Oh, wow. Because it's 10 times better than, you know, banana liqueur that you buy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause it's probably real, real actual fl banana flavoring and not just a fake thing that they've produced somewhere at this yeah. point. Well, I'll be plugging your website down below for anyone listening or watching. Uh, you can find it and click on it and check out, um, all of his recipes. Bray, you are a wealth of knowledge and I, um, I envision maybe in the future there being a part two to this because uh, a little behind the scenes look for anyone. When we first started chatting, um, normally I'm the one throwing out uh, ideas for questions and Bray was like, hey, I would love to talk about these 12 possible things. Let's narrow it down. So um, we've only touched the top of the iceberg for, I mean, what Bray knows and what I want to know <laughs> from Bray. So I, I would love to have you on again and talk even more because I have a feeling that we could go on for hours and hours and hours. Um, Absolutely. I like would we love talked it. about earlier, this, the pool is deep and it just de goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And um, that's probably my favorite part of mead making. It's just getting to dive deeper each time. Oh yeah. So, thank you for coming on uh, and taking your time. I know that again, this is a Saturday morning and um, I'm sure you got brew chores to do. It seems like you got a lot of things happening in your world. Um, there's some Indeed, meat chores all the time. in your Saturday. So uh, I'll be plugging your the website down below. 
Thank you everyone for listening. Bray, thanks for being here again. Um, this has been a blast. Hey, thanks for inviting me anytime. Hey, we'll be, hopefully we'll be back with a part two in the future, but um, until then, see you guys later. Bye.